Oh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you catch this. And just want to share a few things with you. Um, you know, Carter G. Woodson said, if you can control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. And when you determine what he thinks, you don't have to concern yourself about what he's going to do. And all you have to do is make him feel inferior. And you don't have to force him to accept himself as an inferior. He's going to seek it out himself. And if you make a man think he's an outcast, you don't have to order him to the back uh, back door. Or, you know, and I guess I saw him growing up uh, to the back of the bus where all the black kids want to go. He's going to go to the back door without being told. And if there's no back door, his nature will demand one. And so, I want you to listen to this all the way to the end because I'm going to say some things that might upset some of you before I get to the end. But I'm going to talk about some ideas that if properly implemented could actually move us forward as a community and so i'm gonna start off firing a few shots so hold on to your seat and that's why i said stick around because i need to put some stuff out there right quick can we do what i propose i believe we can but the question is will we do what I propose. Now, we're going to have to learn how to discern so that we can weed out destructive elements within our race before they gain a stronghold. I don't care who gets upset, but every time we start to move forward as people, some eugenicized, master pleasing Negro comes along with an agenda from his master and proposes ideas to us that derail us and take us off track. Hey, those days are over. These Negroes get paid to derail us, and once Mass is through with them, or her, they want to run back to us and act like we've always been family, one big happy family. They even launch their lifestyle at, this, at the expense of destroying ours, and then they want to act like we're in the same boat. The best thing we can do for Negroes like that is throw them overboard. Many of our ancestors were actually freed in 1873. I know history teaches you 1875, I mean 1865. But 1865 was when word got down here to Texas, uh, when the Boats came down through Galveston, and that's when the slaves down here had actually got word that they had been freed two years earlier. So the slaves down here continued to work for another two years under whip. And so that's why you have Juneteenth down here, because it was within that week when the boats arrived in Galveston. Uh, between June 13th and June 19th. There's no uh, exact date as far as I remember uh, come across any research. So in spite of that, within 10 years, Blacks had made substantial economic progress. It was so substantial that the system paid W.E.B. Du Bois to derail a progress. And he would later apologize, but it came, you know, 50 years later. And I think the only reason he apologized at that time, because he was close to 100 years old when he passed. And I think he was just trying to clear his conscience before he, before he died. And even in spite of that, because they went in a full assault mode once Booker T. Washington died in 1915. But in spite of that, Blacks still recovered, and they started building 
greatly once again. And they had built so much that in the 1930s, black net worth was over $2 billion. Now, this was also the period of the manufactured Great Depression. And, and you know, and in spite of some blacks struggling as well as whites, and all of the legislation put in place to block black progress, blacks were actually still moving forward. Blacks were actually recovering better than whites because they kept their family units intact, first of all, and they actually had a shorter position to fall from economically. So recovery was a lot easier for black people at the time. So we started to see some black folks start to advance economically. And we had some black multimillionaires that actually came along right through the 1960s. And see, history doesn't teach us that, that part of our black culture. And guess what happened in the 60s? Y'all all know what happened in the 60s. The system found MLK to the real black progress. Now, I don't care if you get mad. The system has told black folks to honor him. Well, my research doesn't show me that. And that's why you've never heard me promote MLK on none of my videos. He even said that he didn't want to give whites the idea or impression that blacks wanted to be separate. So many of the black businesses needed to be destroyed. Hey, don't take my word for it. Go and research it for yourself. Once he found out he was used as a tool, he would actually tell Harry Belafonte he messed up. But even with both of these men apologizing, their influence over black America was so strong in the derailment process that it was way too late to recover from the path they had led us down. Who do you think financed the civil rights movement? Did you know MLK was also given the Margaret Sanger Award? He said words, these are his exact words. He said words were inadequate. Words were inadequate to show how honored he was to receive the award. And it was one of his most cherished possessions. Now, Margaret Sanger, and many of you know who she is or was, she wanted to kill black undesirables as she called them. And her organization gave our most herald leader an award. Wouldn't you think that should have been an award that MLK rejected because it came from the organization that wanted to destroy blacks? Well, when you understand who was financing him and the movement and their background, and then you put Sanger and her background together, you have a lot better understanding. But what we were never taught is that W.E.B. Du Bois and MLK were both eugenicists, as well as many other prominent blacks. Now, if you've heard of any of my videos, you've heard me talk about Booker T. Washington quite a bit. You've heard me mention Kelly Miller, Dean Kelly Miller, from time to time. As much as I respected those men, they were also eugenicists. I lose a lot of respect for people who want to play God and try to decide who's fit to live and who isn't. You abortionists, I have very little respect for you too. You're no different than any other murderer. One of my high school football coaches killed a young lady while I was still in high school. Guess how much respect I had for him after that. You know, it's amazing that these abortionists are quick to tell people it's their body when they want to murder a baby 
But all of a sudden, these same folks think everyone should take a bioweapon shot that's still in the experimental phase and not slated to even be ready in its initial phase until the year 2023. That's two years out. You believe abortion is okay because that's the woman's choice. But now you want to tell other folks how to actually handle their body. And right today, many of your so-called blacks in the spotlight are eugenicists. They want to kill off you undesirable blacks and you sit there and allow them to treat you any kind of way because we share the same skin tone. Now, three of the presidents that people have praised historically have done more damage than any Republican president out there. FDR gave us the New Deal. And, you know, uh, LBJ, well, you know, the New Deal was actually the first plank of the welfare state. Then LBJ gave us the second plank of the welfare state with his great society. And now Joe Biden has entered the third plank. Now, for a moment, let, let's forget about the drugs that Ronald Reagan flooded into the black community, okay? And the reason I say that is because as blacks, we're always on our P's and Q's when a Republican is in office. We watch everything they do like a hawk. If they fought a bird, we try to smell it to see if they had hot sauce with their meal. That's just how close we scrutinize them. When our beloved Democrats are in office, we go into chill mode and don't pay attention to anything that happens under their watch. All of a sudden, we'll say the president doesn't control anything. But when a Republican is in office, look at all this bad stuff he's doing. So I've always stated my position with regards to voting. So put that to rest right now or not. Either way, I don't care. FDR's New Deal, and I personally like to call it the raw deal for black folks, uh, but it actually hurt job prospects for blacks. Over 500,000 blacks lost their jobs because of his policies. Black sharecroppers were hurt by the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Uh, not only were blacks hurt by this act, they were eventually forced to pay higher food prices. The Wagner Act harmed blacks by making labor union monopolies legal. And, and, and you know, many of you know, unions discriminated heavily against blacks. Uh, you need to understand, study who was running the unions too. I ain't going to tell you. It ain't who you've been led to believe. And uh, if you study what um, FDR did with the Tennessee Valley Authority, you see that farm owners got paid after he flooded that land. But the tenant farmers who were black got zero. When the New Deal came out, blacks thought they would gain some benefit by switching party affiliation. But once FDR gained their support, he did what Democrats do. He turned his back on black folks and they got nothing. Sure, a few blacks were able to piggyback off some of the programs, but as a whole, blacks were left out of the benefits. I mean, even the welfare program that was created at that time, go study that and see who got the most benefit. And you know, because society always want to tell you that black women are the biggest recipients. Well, go back and study that New Deal, those New Deal policies and see who welfare was actually put in place for. And so the next plank of the welfare state came with LBJ's Great Society. And I am sick and tired of hearing blacks talk about how LBJ helped us. Yeah, he helped us all right. Helped us to go in reverse. I've mentioned in many videos whose plan it was. Um, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act because Eisenhower had two civil rights bills before the 1964 Civil Rights Bill and both of Eisenhower's bills gave you your civil rights and your voting rights in one package but LBJ gave you the Civil Rights Act in 64 and then he gave you the he stripped the Voting Rights Act portion out of it and then gave you 
the Voting Rights Act in 1965 like he had done two things for you. But Eisenhower had already given it to you. And your savior, MLK, and Roy Wilkins, and Bayard Rustin, and all that crew said Eisenhower didn't do enough. Adam Clayton Powell was the lone black voice who said Eisenhower emancipate was the first president to give blacks emancipation again since the Emancipation Proclamation. Even Jackie Robinson got his digs in on Eisenhower. But Eisenhower was doing something no other president had done. Let's see. You think LBJ gets credit for all that. And Eisenhower even said in 1967 that the system wanted to say LBJ created everything that was put in place for blacks when it was actually him. Study it yourself. See, we think just because LBJ met with MLK that he was our friend for some strange reason. Well, if we're going to go with that narrative, Donald Trump is a black people friend too. The Great Society was nothing more than the New Deal Part 2. Both programs offered a governmental solution to poverty. Well, who put the things in place to create the wealth gap in this country in the first place? Even the great Thomas Sowell had something to say about this, but as black people, we tend to ignore his brilliant mind. For some strange reason, we only want the brilliant minds if they vote Democrat. This is what Thomas Sowell said. And I have, I think I have a couple of more quotes written down that I, I'm going to read. Uh, and I kind of paraphrase Carter G. Woodson. I didn't need to write that down. I've read his book so many times, Miseducation of the Negro. I didn't need to write it down. I, I could almost, well, I didn't quote it verbatim, but, you know, you get the gist of it. But I need to read what Thomas Sowell said. But he said, uh, the black family, which had, had survived centuries of slavery and discrimination, began rapidly disintegrating in the liberal welfare state that subsidized unwed pregnancy and changed welfare from an emergency rescue to a way of life. Before LBJ's programs, black families were largely intact. Now, depending on whose figures you use, black families had both parents in the house between 50 and 80% of the time before the Great Society program, even after the New Deal or the Raw Deal. And so I've seen both figures, so I'm not sure which one is correct. But it's still better than a 6% figure that black families had in 1980. Out of wedlock birth were around 20% before the Great Society. And black women were more than likely to be married than white women. Now, I'm not going to stay on this long. Uh, it's just plenty of research for the one who really wants to see the impact that these programs caused in the black community. And... The last plank uh, is Joe Biden's um, plank. And I mean, if we study Joe Biden's history, he done, put a, he done laid a whole lot of bullets down to destroy black people. But he's a Democrat, so they can slap your mama, slap your daddy, kick your sister in the rear end, and, and y'all will run to the voting booth and, and vote for him because if somebody told you what they did, you'd be asking what your family member did to cause them to do them like that. It's just how stupid we are. So, some of you may have heard that a triple braided cord is hard to dismantle. And, uh, you know, I've talked about the other triple braided cord that was created in the, in the 60s, the 1960s. The feminist movement, Great Society. And it's in the civil rights movement. I call that the decade of hell. And we don't know no better. But the third strand is being woven right now with Jim Crow Joe. 
He's working to pay family with kids $300 a month per child. And he says that it would lift many black families out of poverty. Now, at what point are y'all black people who voted for him going to check this dude? Not locking up all of our black men for misdemeanors was the best route to keep our black children out of poverty. Not paying our black women to keep the black men out of the house to get those little welfare payments was the best route to keep our black families out of poverty. Who in their right mind actually believe that a $300 monthly boost is going to lift anyone out of poverty? If you believe that, you need a mental enema. My granddaughter works at a Foot Locker store and she called me the very next day after those stimulus checks hit people's bank accounts. And she said the store was flooded with people buying tennis shoes. Guess what color she said the people were that were in there buying up all the tennis shoes. She said they were in there dropping four five hundred dollars on tennis shoes. Now, Biden's VP, Kamala Harris, an old communist, Barry Sanders, want to give people a monthly $2,000 check. How long have I been mentioning the universal basic income? They're setting a trap for you, and you don't even see it because your head is so far up their rear ends especially with the sister girl black magic and since i'm on this up <laughs> that topic right now uh isn't it amazing that harris and biden ran to the aid of asian americans after the shooting over in georgia point out one time when she ran to the aid of a black group of people who got home by a shooter but she sure knew how to lock black folks up she ran to those asian americans because they had basically kicked her to the curb during the campaign because they said she wasn't authentic and she only courted black voters for political gain and just totally forgot about them and that's her heritage that they say she forgot about they said they don't have the votes that blacks have so she just totally ignored them on a the campaign trail I wish y'all could have saw some of the stuff that those Asian Indians had to say about her. But we got that black girl magic. But, I mean, I, I, I just, I'm just amazed at the things that these people do to us as a people. And then we're so stupid. And I mean, intellectual challenge is just not working for me right now. I got to call it what it is, just stupid. We're so stupid that we still go and vote for these people. They could rape you, murder you, do all this stuff and you still vote for them. Hey, you know, y'all were talking about after George Floyd, the George Floyd incident, the Ahmaud Arbery incident, the Breonna Taylor incident. Let's defund the police. And then we go vote for the guy who wrote the 94 crime bill. He wrote an 84 bill. He wrote an 86 bill. He wrote an 88 bill that locked up black people. And then we go vote for him. And his vice president, who had no issue locking up black people at will. Something wrong with us in the head. But we want to defund the police, but we vote for the police. I think uh, Minnesota Police Department just got, what, $750 million? So, so that, that's a pretty big defund defunding package, ain't it? See, I told you. These people just lie to y'all to get y'all to vote for them. 
then they turn their backs on you. I mean, just like reparations. Every other group that was able to get some form of reparations got direct cash payments. What they talking about for black folks? Well, we gonna give y'all access to better housing, uh, better interest rates on housing. We gonna give you access to better jobs. We gonna give you access to better school. And they ain't giving y'all no direct cash payments. But y'all can't think. And so, now that Harris has no use for black people anymore, she's running back home just like every other Democrat black people vote for. And so, once this program goes into effect, and since you got Democrat majority in the House and the Senate, uh, you might get what you voted for. And the sad thing is, you don't even know what you voted for. But some kind of way y'all uh, managed to blame a Republican. Y'all are blame Trump for it. I mean, I, I, I don't know what to say. But once this program goes into effect, you can pretty much stick a fork in black people because they're done. I mean, we, we pretty much that anyway as a people. Ambition is going to fall by the wayside because it's almost there anyway. Free money is too attractive for people to let go. But let me tell you something. The money ain't free. What is the price of your dignity? I cannot tell you how many people I've talked to over the years that have told me they didn't want to make more money because it would interfere with their government check. And they don't want to lose that money. Some of these amounts of these checks were pretty dismal. But it was free. Or so the person thought. As I stated, the cost of that check cost the person their dignity. But they couldn't see it. The government is continuing to subsidize people so they don't have to work. Think about how many people made more on unemployment than they did working full time last year when they were giving out those $600 a week payments. See, $600 a week equates to $15 an hour minimum wage, 40 hours. So, you got people that are not going to go back into the job market as long as the government is paying them not to work. I mean, what? I mean, I've never um, filed for unemployment, but I'll, I heard all you got to do is show evidence that you're looking, and that can be anything. I mean, you see how easy they make it for you to play the system? Uh, here's something that I read by a gentleman named Ben Kinchlow, uh, older black gentleman. He passed a few years ago. Uh, but he wrote a book sometime back back called uh some I'm, I'm I'm drawing a blank on the exact name of the book, but something about a yellow dog democrat or something like that. But you can look him up. Ben Kinchlow, K I N C H L O W. But Mr. Kinchlow said this, I had to pull this too. He said perhaps one of the most misunderstood concept ever to strike at the mind of man is a clear understanding of individual freedom. People generally associate freedom with the traditional concepts of slavery, legal restrictions, and technical restraints. And governments typically take steps to curtail the liberties of the citizenry for fear of losing powers of control. I mean, think about that. You know, how many of you out here or mad at the people who won't comply because the government's got your mind already. Most people have either a mistaken version or no concept of what it means to be free. Freedom is the essence of what makes America different from practically every other country that ever existed. And Mr. Kinchelow, uh 
I, I don't believe he will be saying we were free now. Uh, like I said, this is something he, he wrote years ago. Uh, but I mean, I guess compared to every other country around the world, you know, I guess America is still probably the freest. I mean, we can still kind of sort of say what we want to say without repercussions, but they're in full assault on, on that as well. But he said, this is what makes America a beacon of hope and has made it essentially the promised land for practically every person seeking the freedom to achieve. Today, we have reached a point where privileges are being elevated to the level of rights. The rights of some are becoming subject to the privileges of others. Judges and elected officials who do not understand the meaning of the unalienable rights promised in our Constitution are now imposing privileges over rights. I mean, we got a politician over here over here in Dallas. Well, I'm not in Dallas, but here in Texas, over in Dallas, that uh, trying to get a bill passed in the state of Texas where if a criminal breaks in your house, even with a weapon, your first duty is to retreat and not engage them. Well, how about the first duty is the criminal not breaking your house? Mr. Kinslow said, you are and should be free to exercise of your constitutionally protected rights as long as they do not abrogate mine. However, when your privileges trample my rights, we have crossed the line that led to the American Revolution, the right of each to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is unfortunate that many have reached the stage of believing they have the moral and are now seeking the legal right to impose their assessments of right and wrong, moral, immoral, true, false on others. We have reached the stage where there are those who would now seek to legally deny others the right to disagree with their pattern of behavior. How many people have lost their job because they've been considered homophobic? How many people, our, our friend sent me a video the other day, father up in Canada, uh, his daughter's 15 now, but at age 14, she wanted to identify as a boy and wanted to start taking hormones so she could transition to a boy. The mother was all for it. The father was totally against it. The court sided with the girl and the mother. It got so bad that the judge threatened the father with imprisonment if he even referred to his daughter as a she. I mean, look at where we are in society. When are we going to stop looking for the Democrat solution? When are we going to stop looking for the Republican solution and start looking within ourselves, within our race, and within our communities for the solution? I cannot say the black church of the solution because in reality it has been a total and abject failure how can i say that look at the neighborhood surrounding them so the solution isn't with them either now i didn't say god is not the solution don't mistake my words i know a lot of black preachers will take issue with what with what i just said but their record bears no fruit at all if we had black men come back home, we wouldn't need as many preachers anyway. These preachers have actually become absentee husbands controlling our home from their pulpits. Our black men need to take the power back from these shucksters. Why is it that we as a people get excited about relief programs as black people? I mean... Everybody I saw on my social media profiles that was talking about they can't wait 
for their stimulus check. This is what they going to do with their stimulus check. Was black. Not one white person that's on my social media network accounts or whatever you want to call them was talking about the stimulus. Now, some of you might have some ideas about why and why, but I'm not here for all that. I'm just telling you, why do we get so excited about the government giving us pennies? How many of you could survive paying all your expenses for one month with $1,400? I just told you what my granddaughter said black folks are doing with their stimulus checks. And that, that just reminds me of something my sister said years ago. Kids come to her classroom, got the latest tennis shoes on, all the fashionable clothes, the newest iPhone, uh, t cell phone. Uh, they got the Beats headphones, and now they got the paws in the ear. She said, but they don't even have pen and paper. So we have a big disconnect because our parents go and spend their hard-earned income on making their kids look cool and good but they won't spend any money on trying to help put something in their head. They'd rather put something on their head than in their head. So we got a major disconnect. So do we really believe that if we get some type of benefit from the government that they actually care about us? You can guarantee if you as a black person got some government benefit, there's a white person somewhere that got 10 to 50 times more than you. Hey, if you're white, don't get mad at me. It is what it is. You might not be a white person who saw a benefit, but somewhere, some white people did at a much higher level than black folks. We talk of the white folks that were given land at no charge, and the black folks got nothing. They never got their 40 acres in the mule. Well, I've told you many times before, some black folks did get 40 acres. They didn't get the mule yet, but they had got the land. General Sherman had written the order. And so when Abe Lincoln was shot, his vice president, who was a Democrat, took the land back from black folks and gave it back to the plantation owners. Most people can't see the idea behind a lot of these things put in place. Let me say this very, very slowly so you can really understand it. Democrats do not mean black folks any good now, and they haven't in the past. Don't come at me talking about Republicans because you don't vote for them. The last Republican to even get more than 10% of the black vote was Gerald Ford, and I think he got around 15%. These folks, your Democratic masters, want you to suffer. How is it we've been voting for these people all these years, and we're still suffering as a people? It ain't the Republicans doing us injustice. The Republicans doing everybody injustice. The Democrats doing everybody injustice, but they do it larger to blacks because blacks are the only loyal voting base in this entire country. But your Democrats don't care about you. But you keep thinking things gonna change by continuing to do the same thing over and over again. What did Carter G. Woodson say about that? He said, if you keep voting the same way for several generations, you deserve what you get. Now, I'm paraphrasing again. And we getting what we deserve. Nothing. You have to change your thinking. But you won't listen to me. Some of you have been fortunate to not have had your income touched at all during the last 12 months. But when all else fails, Blame Trump. We are so lacking in our research efforts that the media told us Trump was the reason everything was bad 
over the last 12 months and we ran with it not even realize folks were lying to us from day one now as a side note the total deaths in 2020 were right in line with the total deaths from the average of the last 10 years so where are all of the bioweapon deaths we were told about and where what happened to all of the flu and pneumonia deaths that are normally reported every year i'll tell you where they are they got counted this past year they just got called something else and we fell for it where are they where are those deaths even in that how many of you know people who did lose their jobs but i can't say their job you lose a job because if it's a job it's not yours it's owned by somebody else and if you don't own a company it's not your job but how many of you know people who lost their vehicles because they couldn't make the note how many of you know people who lost the place they live because they couldn't make the note other than the narrative plastered in front of us all day every day about how we should live in fear be afraid of human contact not visit with one another did you realize how fragile the job market really is did you realize how fragile entire industries are what if we grew our own food what if we found out what each person in our neighborhood did for a living and we utilized their services instead of calling someone from another area to come in and do it now i know this is difficult in some situations i've had my fair share of trying to hire people from within the community and they have this mentality for some strange reason that because we share the same skin tone they can do substandard work and show up periodically instead of regularly what if you use the barber on the corner what if we respected people and their things so much that we could exchange tools when a neighbor needs one and return it in the same condition that we received it in and return it in a timely manner what if each person in the neighborhood focused on growing one crop outside of their profession and we exchange produce organic produce within the neighborhood among each other what if we taught our young men how to rake leaves cut grass trim trees paint houses do construction work do plumbing work on cars and what if we also taught them how to be engineers nurses doctors and ceos think about this what are the chances that some of the more upscale grocery stores will come into black neighborhoods you know what we do have a lot of though we have a whole lot of cathedrals of commerce. I, I, mean, I mean, I'm sorry, I mean churches. The thing that has always troubled me about that, even as a child, was why we had so many churches, many of them with small congregations, instead of several preachers coming together and forming one large church. The church I was baptized in had a very small congregation. I think the, the church I went to maybe on a Sunday had 40 people in it. And right today, that same church has about maybe 80 people in it. Now, I don't attend there anymore. I'm just saying. And so the church I was baptized in had that small congregation. And the neighborhood where the church is maybe has two to 300 homes it, it might be a few more but it's a small neighborhood and in that neighborhood there were three churches does that even make sense make that make sense to me i was talking to my wife the other day and we were talking about the churches in our community i told her that one church we visited a couple of times has a new facility in the heart of a black neighborhood um when I was growing up, one of my aunts lived directly across the street from that church. And the new church is basically in the same spot. Much larger. More beautiful. But crime has always been high around that church. And most every other church in the black neighborhoods all over this country. The white man ain't forcing us into the life of crime. 
The white man is not forcing us to break into those black churches. We as a people have been labeled the most spiritual group in this entire nation. Yet every church in a black neighborhood has a high crime footprint surrounding it. How is that? If we're doing our jobs properly as parents, a lot of this behavior would be minimized. Now, I didn't say eliminate it because they're always going to be rebels against morality. But how can these pastors get up and talk about God every freaking Sunday? Which if you study a little bit, that's Sunday is worship the Sunday. So uh, just so you know. But how can they get up and talk about all these moral things and biblical living? And once you open the doors of the church, all you see is death, destruction. And immorality. A lot of your parishioners head straight to the liquor store after service is over. Now, Malcolm X said we needed to become involved in a program of re education uh, to educate our people in the importance of knowing that when you spend your dollar out of the community in which you live, the community in which you spend your money become richer and richer. The community out of which you take your money becomes poor and poor. And because these Negroes who have been misled, misguided, are breaking their necks to take their money and spend it with the man, the man is becoming richer and richer. And you're becoming poor and poor. And then what happens? The community in which you live becomes a slum. It becomes a ghetto. The conditions become run down. And then you have the audacity to complain about poor housing in a rundown community while you're running down yourself when you take your dollar out. Now, I mean, it's, it's about time for me to get the tires rotated on my wife's car. Uh, how many discount tires have you seen in a predominantly black neighborhood anywhere around this country? What about nice family dining restaurants instead of fast food, chicken and fish and hamburger places littering every corner? There's a Burger King not far from my house and my wife wanted a Whopper one time. This, this was some years ago. And I drove over there and they said uh, I would have to order a chicken sandwich because they were out of beef. <laughs> but I, I just thought that was kind of funny you know when I talked about them places littering every corner um, not far from where I live right now they're building a water burger and guess what there are people complaining about it uh, building it near their house you know hey part of urbanization is having close proximity to convenience even over in Third Ward here in Houston, there's a place called a turkey leg cut. The new residents are complaining about the smoke from the restaurant because it interferes with their air. Well, guess what? Third Ward has, for the most part, always been predominantly black. But through gentrification and black flight, I'm going to emphasize black flight, a lot of other cultures have moved in and they think they own the rights to everything including the air. It's amazing to me that people want the convenience, but they want it to come at someone else's expense. Some years back, we fought against a crushed concrete company uh, from putting a facility in our community and our congresswoman at the time sided against us. We complained about something that could cause respiratory illnesses and our congresswoman sold us out. And these people complaining about smoke from food. And they couldn't live next to me if I was barbecuing. Because they'd be calling the fire department. I, not bragging, you know. I just remember one time I was out there barbecuing. And uh, somebody from around the corner came driving. Because they thought somebody's house was on fire. And, and uh, I like when I smoke my meat. I want you to know it's been smoked. But 
How many Trader Joe's or Whole Foods markets have you seen in any predominantly black neighborhood around this country? Have you seen a Kroger or a Fred Meyer, Safeway, Randall's or Tom Thumb in any predominantly black areas around this country? And I just said those names are different uh, names of the same companies. What about Outback Steakhouse or Saltgrass Steakhouse? How about Applebee's or Martin Steakhouse or Longhorn Steakhouse? What about a place like Fogo de Chao, Brazilian Steakhouse? I mean, I'm just using steakhouses as an example because that's normally some of the type places we go for elegant eating or a place like we have over here in the Galleria called Grand Lux, where you... How many places like that do you find in predominantly black communities? What about an emergency urgent care center or a big time hospital facility? How about something like academy, athletic store? Do you have to drive to a neighborhood that is considered safer than yours to buy books from a store like Barnes and Noble? I mean, you get the idea. Is there a footlock in your community? We don't have the better quality stores in our communities. So we go to work, earn our pay, come home, and get dressed to go out and spend our dollars in other communities. Therefore, depleting our own communities of its resources. Some of us get tired of having to venture out of the neighborhood to spend money, so we just move to those neighborhoods. That's called black flight. We have turned our black communities into economic wastelands of our own doing. And we have the nerve to complain about gentrification. Give me a break. Can I let you on a list in on a little secret? About 90% of blacks who complain of gentrification either live in multicultural or predominantly white neighborhoods. So shut your pie hole. You don't have the right to complain about gentrification because you abandon the place you say you love. So shut your mouth. Until you come back, shut your mouth. What if we could start building something in our families, in our neighborhoods, and in our communities? The bioweapon has practically put a stop to seeing your family members. And so many people are captivated by the media fear mongering that we don't even want to hug our family members anymore. We don't want to visit each other's home because the media has scared us into submission to the governing authorities instead of us being in submission to the higher powers like we're supposed to be. If you walk around with a, without a mask on, the obedient people look at you like you're the crazy one. Sadly, most of them have done no research at all. They're just following the narrative and they have a problem with people who want to exercise their freedom. I see people walking outside in fresh, open air space with masks on. I see people driving in their cars with the windows up and down with masks on. But we don't want to love on each other because the government told us that it was dangerous. No, the most dangerous thing is the people who think the government has the interests of the people at heart. We have to get back to family and community and government can't help us do that. That's going to require some patience, uh, some diligence, some education and some resources to do uh, some of those things properly. At what point have we become so narrow minded that we don't value the opinions of the people we have loved and called our friends for years. We would rather take the advice of someone we don't know over someone that we do. Some of you have excellent sources of people within your inner circle who can actually educate you, but you look past them because they may not have a degree or they may not have a title or they may have not been schooled in that arena. But these type of people have said, forget the schooling. And then they went out and got educated. 
See, they're not the same thing. Your degree doesn't make you smarter than anyone. Am I putting education down? No, but education and schooling are not the same thing. Schooling leaves a lot to be desired. I was thoroughly unhappy in school because a lot of my teachers were trying to force me into a box. I don't like to be forced into a box. I like to be creative. That's why I loved Woodshop so much in school. Woodshop allowed me to be creative. I took art. I wasn't so enthused about art, but I still, you know, did my little work in there. But I, when you're in Woodshop, that's big creative. When you're in art class, that's little creative. When you're in those structured classes, that's no creative. You know, I haven't used algebra and calculus and trigonometry and elementary analysis and geometry since I left college. Why was nobody teaching us accounting? Why was nobody teaching us the stock market? Why wasn't anybody teaching us how to balance a checkbook? Why wasn't anybody thinking us teaching us life skills. When the last time you used chemistry if you don't have a degree or background in engineering? Are you working at NASA? When the last time you used that stuff? And based on subject verb agreement that I see people use nowadays, a lot of them need to go back to English class anyway. So stop getting mad at the people who got educated. My best education came once I stopped attending school. I hated school, but the law said I had to go. I hated school. I love education. I love education. And I love people who go get education. Not putting your schooling down. But I'm utterly amazed at black folks who have spent their entire lives complaining about the system. But then these same folks do everything in their power to protect that same system. You can't be trusted. The only thing the school system does now is indoctrinate you to take orders. The school system was designed like the assembly line. Go and study the school system from Prussia and you will see exactly how the school system in America came to be. We're producing right today what they set in motion in 1902. These people that do these things are very patient in what they're doing. They know they can't implement stuff immediately because people will reject it. So y'all don't even understand if if they get if they told you we were going to be locked down indefinitely until 2025, March 31st, 2025, they know the people would rise up and rebel. So they just keep giving you little glimmers of hope. Just a few more months, you know, 14 days till we curb, till we get it curbed. You know, let's get in a few months, we we'll have herd immunity. They sticking them swabs all the way up into your brain so they can find that old cold and flu and pneumonia matter and then come back and say, that's why you tested positive. Because if they tested right on the surface, they wouldn't find anything that would test you positive. That's why they got to dig up into your pineal gland, pineal gland, I have you pronounce it, up there in your hypothalamus. And they, they sticking them Q-tips way up there because they trying to find matter, old matter that your body still has so you can test positive. 
Y'all don't know nothing. Hey, two of my sisters have their master's degrees. One has a bachelor, and no one is more proud of their accomplishments than me as the big brother. But we're going to have to say to hell with government mandates. Mandates are not laws. And before you say something stupid in your mind, slavery was the law. So the law doesn't mean it's right. Jim Crow Joe says you can possibly meet with your family for the 4th of July if you do what you told to do by big government. So y'all sitting around here waiting on permission? I saw a meme the other day and it had Joe Biden and said, uh, if you do what we put in place, you can have your barbecues for the 4th of July. And right below it, there was a guy said, and from Mississippi said, y'all actually stop barbecuing? So, law doesn't make something right. Now, since y'all waiting on permission, I'll give you permission right now to meet with your family before the end. Do black people celebrate the 4th of July? Oh, my bad. Y'all only start celebrating Juneteenth when Donald Trump said something about it. Y'all ignored it up until that point. But whatever Donald Trump said, y'all always made sure to do the opposite of it. Y'all can't think. My daddy always celebrated Juneteenth up until his health didn't allow it. Always. My daddy never worked on Juneteenth. Never. And all of a sudden, y'all act like I, I even saw some black folks say, why nobody ever told us? I and mean, that just proved the point I'm always talking about. You don't study nothing. It takes somebody else to get you activated. And I guarantee you a lot of y'all this year ain't going to celebrate Juneteenth because Trump out of office. See why I can't take y'all serious? Have you ever read Frederick Douglass's speech? What is the 4th of July to the Negro? Why are you waiting for government permission? What is What if within your family, someone set up a bank account that requires two or three signatures before money could be withdrawn? And each household in your family contribute an amount to the account once a month. Let's say $10, 20 or $50 each. And at the end of that 12-month period, the family planned something nice. And the only money that would be spent came from the account to handle everything. Y'all could make reservations at a nice restaurant or you could rent a place and cater food in or reserve space at a park and have a live band and food catered in. This way, no one's having to spend time working and the family can enjoy each other. Maybe each person, depending on the size of the family, could get up and tell the rest of the family how the last 12 months of their lives have been going. Uh, maybe share their future goals with each other so the entire family could cheer them on toward their success over that time frame. And when the family gets together in the next 12 months, the entire family could celebrate the accomplishment together. What example would this set for future generations? I know of a family who used to do this, and they contributed so much that they actually went to different states each year for their family reunion. Now, I'm not sure if they still do it. It wasn't my family. I just happened to get hired as their DJ one year when they were having a festivities here in Houston. They hired me for the whole weekend. Do you think our family bonds would get tight again as they once were? And just think about it. When each one of us sets a goal and we tell a family about it, look at the cheerleading section that we have created for each other. Everyone would want to see the other person succeed and accomplish. Let's stop keeping our victories to ourselves. Let's celebrate one another all the time. If things get difficult because everyone knows what we're shooting for, when we ask for prayer, they know exactly how to pray for us and what to pray for. Look at how much power we have in doing something like that. Let's face it. We all run into a mental wall or a mental block from time to time. We need someone sometimes to help us smash through it. Now, how would our black neighborhood start to look if our families start loving each other properly, loving the area around them, and loving their neighbor like the Bible says? What if each family starts to do this amongst themselves? 
how much power is in that. Now, I read something years ago. Um, it was talking about, I think it might have been one of John Maxwell's books, or it might have been Ben Carson. Ben Carson has a book called uh, The Big Picture, I think. But let's talk about some big picture thinking. Transfer that same mentality to the neighborhood you live in. What if each family in the neighborhood got together and started something like blacks used to have over a century ago called mutual aid associations or mutual aid societies? These associations would be for improving the neighborhoods we live in, possibly hiring security to patrol in order to minimize crime and let outsiders and insiders know that we don't play that here. We can be honest. Our relationship with the local police departments across the country leave a lot to be desired right now. I've mentioned some of the response times in past videos. So why would a criminal have to worry about anything, knowing how the police lack of response will guarantee that they don't get caught? What if, as I stated about the number of homes in the neighborhood where I went to church growing up, what if each one of those homes was contributing to a fund each month for the neighborhood and the neighborhood only? Let's say you have 300 homes in your immediate neighborhood. If each household gave $10 a month to the fund, that's $3,000 a month. And over 12 months, that would be $36,000 in that account. What if each household increased that to $20 a month? Now, let me stretch your thinking a bit. What if each household felt so strongly about what we were trying to accomplish and they sacrificed and gave $50 or $100 a month to the fund? Well, let me go ahead and step on some toes. Take the money from your unbiblical tithing and give it to the fund. I guarantee you, if we did this, we could get more accomplished in one year for every black neighborhood in this country than the church the black church has done in the last 10, 20, or 50 years. There are no utilities to pay this way. There are no mortgages to pay. There's no rent to pay on the building. There are no pastor salaries. Where does the Bible say that any of those things is biblical? Your pastor is not supposed to be paid as a, a job anyway. Study it for yourself. Your pastor need a job or your pastor need his own business. Your pastor shouldn't be fleecing y'all every Sunday to finance his lifestyle or his wife dress better than yours. His kids go to private schools while yours are in these public hell holes. Your pastor shouldn't be going on vacation at your expense while you sit home and haven't took your family on vacation in the last 10, 15, 20 years. You financing him to live better than you. What's wrong with y'all? So take your money from the church and give it into the fund. And I guarantee you, we'll see more progress in our communities within a year than we've seen in the last 50 years in one of these churches. Don't confuse what I'm saying. I don't interchange and mix my words like pastors do. See, pastors will start off talking about tithing and they'll automatically shift their talk into giving like they're not the same thing. But they every message that you hear a pastor, black, white, Asian, Indian, Hispanic, any of them, if they start off talking about tithing in that message, they're going to interchange tithing and giving like they're the same thing. They are not. So I believe we should give to the men of God, but we shouldn't be giving where they don't have to go to work. We should be giving to them out of love. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. The Bible never said God likes a legalistic giver. Tithing is legalistic. Offering is cheerful. So you, you got to understand this stuff. So don't confuse what I'm saying. I don't mix my words like pastors do. I try to explain and make things simple to you. I believe we should give out of love. 
but I don't believe in tithing. And I'm not ashamed to tell any past of that. I don't care. We can sit down with the Bible together. Tithing is mentioned two times in the New Testament, and neither one of them was good. That's why they always have to reach back to Malachi 3. And Malachi 3 is even talking to the preachers. It ain't talking to the people in the congregation. It ain't talking to the parishioners. It's talking to the people that was robbed at the storehouse, which was the priest. But you ain't gonna never hear no preacher tell you that. Read Malachi 3 and then go back and read chapters 1 and 2. And then go read Nehemiah 13 and then see if what they teaching is right. Well, forget right. See if what they teaching is biblical. So I'm going to say this again. I don't believe in tithing. And any pastor that teaches you tithing is teaching error and he's teaching a false doctrine. I don't care what cemetery has taught them to teach you. So you look at all of that available money sitting around waiting on us to help others in need like we are commanded to do. What does the Bible say? The Bible says you help the widowed, you help the poor, you help the hungry, you help the homeless. But what are we being taught from the pulpit? Put in this basket so we can help the pastor, we can help the pastor's wife, we can help the pastor's kid, we can help the pastor's dog, we can help the cat get his kitty litter, we can help the parrot sing in a nightclub. I mean, that's basically what it boils down to. We ain't doing nothing with the money that the church is collecting that the Bible commanded us to do. So cut that off. And I know many of you ain't strong enough to do that. I cut it off a long time ago once I started educating myself. And you don't always have to give into a church. There are people in your community. There are people in your family that need that money more than the church. I remember reading a book by Ed Cole years ago and Ed Cole said, God ain't going to bless you if you know you got a struggling family member that's trying to get ahead and you over there taking your money to a church instead of helping your family member get on their feet. But the church will tell you in a minute, bring that money to the church and let God help them. Why is it the pastors always tell you when he needs something to give, give, give more? But when you need something, he tell you to, Trust God, trust God, trust God. Cut them off. Make them go get a job. That's what you do. That'll cut out a whole bunch of that foolishness coming from the pool pit. I told you before, pool pit rhyme with something else. So look at all that money sitting around waiting on us to help others in need. Do the math on those higher amounts. $50 a month in 300 families is $15,000 a month. And at the end of 12 months, you would have $180,000 sitting in an account to help your neighborhood and your neighborhood only. We've poured billions into the black churches and we don't have anything to show for it in our communities, but a whole bunch of fancy cathedrals of commerce. You got these preachers up there got up there dancing on the money and money coming and people running up from the congregation thinking they're going to get blessed financially. The only people that's being blessed financially is the ones up there telling you to come throw your money up on the pulpit. And you still sitting around here waiting for God to bless you. God can't bless that foolishness. God ain't even blessing them. Y'all blessing them. God is not blessing that behavior. Y'all blessing them. Show me that in the Bible. Now, take it to that number where well, I said $100 a month. That's $30,000 a month. And at the end of 12 months, you would have $360,000 in an account for your neighborhood. Even though interest, low, uh, interest rates are very low, uh, practically non-existent right now. I mean, I know savings account rates, I think they had 0.4%, point, point, uh, yeah, 0.4 or something like that. I mean, it, it, it's, it's pretty terrible. But 
Think about what having some of that money invested could do if it could gain interest uh, when we don't need it until, you know, there's a need. But the beauty in this is we don't stop giving after 12 months. We keep giving each month for the duration of our life because we want our neighborhood to constantly get better. We don't want our kids to grow up in worse neighborhoods. We want them to have a better future. We want our grandkids to have a better future. We want them to feel safe and comfortable in the environments they're growing up in. We want them to have so much pride in the area they grew up in that they don't want to leave and go somewhere else. They want to maintain the family home. They want to help, help keep the black community beautiful. Now, could we then take some of that money and start some productive business establishments? As I stated, we could hire private security. We could beautify our parks. We could hire a company to come through with street sweepers to minimize the trash that we find all over the place. And after we, we really shouldn't even need those because we should have so much pride in our neighborhood that if somebody drives by and throws a piece of trash out a window, one of us should be picking it up anyway. Don't leave trash sitting around in front of your house. Right now, there are a lot of tree branches in front of my house. Um, had my neighbor's tree cut down for. And so there are a lot of branches in front of my house right now. And in the city of Houston, in the odd number of months, they pick up branches, tree branches only. And in the even months, they'll pick up trees and trash. And so the mere fact that all of these trees are in front of my house right now, people just ride through and throw their trash on the pile. Well, with the trash being on the pile, the city trucks will leave those branches there until next month because April's an even month. This is a tree only month. So I have to constantly go out anytime trees are cut around my house and take my claw and pick up all the trash that people are throwing there. I mean, I don't mind doing it because I want to make sure the area around my house is always beautiful and clean, but I shouldn't have to do it. That's the point I'm making. So, but for the, for the sake of what I'm teaching, we could hire street sweepers, okay? If a family has had a member who's lost work, we could go into the fund and we could help take care of that family until gainful employment is obtained. Now, I'm not saying we're going to create a welfare dependency situation. I'm talking about, okay, we need to know what type of expenses this family has, what type of needs this family has, and then we support that need and expense. We're not going to be funding their extravagance. We're not going to be funding their wants. We're going to fund their expenses and their needs. And at the same time, while they're trying to find gainful employment, we should be working together to help them find employment if we know somebody's hiring. And so if we're all doing this in our neighborhoods alone, we would know what family would possibly be struggling and need help. You know, we, we do have to come to grips and know that pride would not allow people to let others know if they need help at times. You know, that lone range of mentality has kind of overtaken us many times, except when we do uh, foolish stuff, and then we start these GoFundMe pages for people to pay for our stupidity. But if we are a cohesive unit in the neighborhood, someone close to that family would know if there was a need and they could let us know. We could create and finance our own little league teams instead of having to put our kids on the corners like hustlers. Hey, kids need to contribute to the neighborhood too, to the neighborhood well-being. They may not have money to contribute, but they can clean up trash, 
They can pull down trash cans of elderly neighbors without expecting a financial return because it's just the right thing to do. Looking out for your elderly neighbors. We teach them that you have to earn your keep. Nobody's going to give you nothing. Kids on the corner with their football helmets soliciting donations is conditioning them to go stand on the corner later on in life. I mean, are, are we not getting this? Are we not getting the mentality that we're passing on to our kids, to our youth? We're teaching them they don't have to work. What does Thessalonians say? A man who doesn't work shouldn't eat. And even that was direct, directly toward the priest, the traveling preachers. Their pay was described over in Luke chapter 10. And it said their pay, their wages, was room and board for the night in the meal. And sometimes, you know, people would give them a little cash, silver or gold or something like that. But we're teaching our kids that it's okay to beg instead of work when we put them on a corner in their football uniforms and the helmet. Guess how many times I get, I put a dollar or anything in a helmet? Zero. You know why? Because my wife and I and my sister and brother-in-law once worked with the youth department at a church we attended together. Guess what we did? Every Saturday, the kids had to go wash cars. The kids didn't see a financial benefit immediately, but we would use the funds that we raised and we'd take them on a trip at the every summer. We'd let them choose the destination. And then we'd tell them, oh, you know, okay, this is what it's going to cost to go to that place. Is this still a goal y'all want to accomplish? Yes. So they had, those kids had to give up every Saturday, even when it was cold outside. The only time we didn't wash cars was when it rained. Now get this. My wife and I didn't have a kid work at that church. My sister and brother-in-law didn't have a kid at that church. But we took our time away and worked with the kids every Sunday, once a month. Each one of the ladies, uh, my sister, my wife, or one of the kids' mothers, they would take turns cooking a dinner. And they would take orders in advance to see who would like to order and buy dinners. That was another way to earn money. We put on carnivals. We walked the community and handed out flyers to invite people to the carnival. So it's real hard for me to put money in a helmet for a kid on the corner. Ain't going to happen, Captain. You as an adult going to have to give it off your lazy butt and teach these kids some responsibility. So what if we use the money in the account to help others start businesses and we ensure the success of the business by patronizing that business? We could loan out the money at reasonable interest rates so we don't place the business owner in position to fail. We fully support that business with an understanding that we also expect them to pay it forward and once their business is profitable, after all expenses are covered, including salaries, we would expect them to also contribute a little more to the pot each month for up and coming potential business owners and other people who may have needs or other needs that might go on within the neighborhood because we're all fighting for the same thing. Is this making sense to you? Now, if we have all of our predominantly black neighborhoods doing this, what would happen if each neighborhood in a certain area of town were to come together as one unit and decide to pool some resources and build a healthy grocery store that serves the entire community? What if, as I stated earlier, each one of us specializing in growing one crop 
and we could sell that organic produce to the stores and we could actually price the organic produce at reasonable rates which is why black people normally don't have organic produce in their stores because we all know organic costs a lot more to work with and produce than conventionally grown. Well, conventionally grown produce is filled with pesticides. Guess what pesticides are doing? Because you can't wash all of them off. They're going into our bodies. So what if we built a healthy grocery store that served the entire community? We own it as a collective. That way, nobody can come in and try to buy one person out or buy two people out. And we utilize the funds to pay employees. We utilize the funds to pay expenses to run the store. And then everything that over it goes into a capital gains account, you know, because you're going to have stuff break down from time to time. You're going to have stuff that needs to be repaired. But we also would take resources from that store and put into, you know, we see what's left open. And we divide that up among each individual neighborhood. Does that make sense? I know one household plot would not be able to supply a large community store. But with 300 homes in each neighborhood at a minimum, we would have several people growing some of the same vegetables and fruits. We could definitely supply a community store then. What if we learned how to can and preserve food? What if once a month all of us came together at a farmer's market to sell our organically produced goods to one another? You know what else this does? With us opening the businesses, we've now put ourselves in a position to give people jobs. Adults and our kids, our teenagers, so they're not on the street. This would drastically cut down our unemployment rate among our race. Uh, when people are gainfully employed, it's amazing that crime seems to lessen because the people who are working don't have time to sit around and come up with schemes to go and do wrong. What's the saying? An idle mind is the devil's playground? I mean, you've heard it, haven't you? Now, let me ask a question. Is the church in your neighborhood doing this? Now, we all know the answer to that question. It was a rhetorical question. Has the church you attend ever done this? We also know the answer to that question. Because if they did it, we see the evidence somewhere. One of the reasons many of your black churches and white churches are in love with government programs is because they have failed in their biblical duty to mankind. We keep complaining about being at the bottom of the economic barrel, but we keep contributing to an institution that gives us a feeling for a couple of hours once a week. Hey, we can get that from a prostitute. Other than a back to school drive or turkey handout at Thanksgiving and Christmas, what else does your church spend money on to help the people in the community? And even think about that. When they had a back to school drives and a turkey handout, who's actually bringing the stuff to the, school, to the church anyway? So y'all still coming out of pocket to make the church look good. I mean, we got to wake up. Um, so you don't have any other money going to help anybody in the community. Well, you know, most black churches are going to spend that money on past and wife appreciation and anniversary service. Any version of the Bible, bring to me. You ain't going to find that in there. I guarantee you, you ain't going to find that one version of a Bible that's going to support past and wife appreciation anniversary services. Not a one. Not a one. That ain't biblical. The Bible says when you do things like that, you're worshiping the created. What do you think your statues are? You're worshiping a, worshiping a created thing. Now, believe what you want, but 
God does not bless that no matter how many times we do. Black church board members and deacons sit around renting limousines for the pastor and his wife and they anniversary celebration and the church sits in the middle of a rundown section of the city. Why isn't that money used to work within the neighborhood? Hey, take this information however you want. I care, but I don't care. I care about the state of black America, but I don't care if you get offended by anything I've said. Remove your feelings and take the message. Not that I'm great, but you have to admit, this is a brilliant idea to implement in our neighborhoods all over the country. I'm thinking all the time, and if we could learn how to properly work together, remove egos, leave the different religions at the door, and stop acting like our degrees make us more valuable than others, we could accomplish great things in my opinion. Can we do it? I believe we can. Will we do it? I don't know about it. For a person that totally identifies with the school system, everything leads toward the degree. But for the person who identifies with learning, everything becomes a teacher. Or everybody can become a teacher. But hey, what do I know?